From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now, at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome, Inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. A little more than 150 years ago, the Great Chicago Fire ravaged the Windy City. The story goes that in the barn of Catherine and Patrick O'Leary, a cow kicked over a lamp that started the blaze that would destroy tens of thousands of buildings and killing 300 people and causing about $200 million in damage, which is about $4 billion in today's dollars. The legend behind the fire may be apocryphal, but the damage and havoc it wrought were very real. Chicago did more than just rebuild, though. It reinvented itself rising from the ashes like a phoenix with massive economic development projects, huge population growth, and architects laying the groundwork for some of the world's first skyscrapers. The city doubled in size in nine years and soon was a major American metropolis. The story of the fire is tragic, but the story of Chicago's rebuild is one of hope. Architects and engineers came together nearly immediately to reinvent their home and make it less prone to risk. Reconstruction, reimagination, and redesign, however, don't need to be a part of the aftermath of a catastrophic event. As life circumstances change, you need more room and more features, an upgrade to the fixtures, cabinetry, ambiance, and livability of a place. There are few things that are more important than your home. It's where you house your family, host your friends, a source of pride. Fortune Brands Home and Security is in the business of making the things that make our homes beautiful, operational, and safe. 25 miles outside of Chicago sits Deerfield, Illinois. This suburb between Evanston and Kenosha on the road to Milwaukee is home to Fortune Brands. That's NYSE ticker symbol FBHS, a company built on innovative products for kitchen, bathrooms, entryways, and outdoor living spaces. At the helm of the firm is Nicholas Fink, CEO of Fortune Brands Home and Security. With the market-leading positions across its business segments, the company's 27,500 associates work with a purpose to fulfill the dreams of home. Our conversation with Nick Fink is coming up right after this. ICE is home to liquid global energy markets, including the broadest range of natural gas benchmarks from the U.S. and Canada to Europe and Asia, Natural gas markets are globalizing, driven by new LNG dynamics. The relationship between Europe and Asia is taking center stage in natural gas price formation. In Europe, we provide access to the two leading benchmarks, MBP and TTF. In Asia, the Japan-Korea marker is the benchmark for pricing Northeast Asian markets. Focused on South and West Asia, ICE's West India marker LNG futures contract supports growing natural gas demand in India and the Middle East. Against the backdrop of the U.S. shale revolution, market participants have become refocused on regional, physical, and financial gas markets. In North America, we offer the most comprehensive collection of locations and liquidity in the physical and financial gas markets. ICE offers the most comprehensive complex of global natural gas benchmarks. These deep and diverse markets allow for transparent pricing across the globe. Our guest today, Nicholas Fink, is CEO of Fortune Brands Home and Security a Fortune 500 company and a leader in the home products industry. Previously served as president and chief operating officer until his promotion to CEO in January of 2020. Nick also oversaw the global plumbing group and grew the business from a single brand to its highest margin business. A wildcat from Northwestern, Nick joined the company in 2015 and previously worked at Beam Global Spirits and Wine and is a partner at Bell, Boyd & Lloyd. Welcome, Nick, inside the Ice House. Thanks, Josh. Pleasure to be here. So, Nick, I've been a fan of Fortune Brands for a long time through my old friendship with Clarks and Hine, mostly for that spirits business that really hasn't been a part of it for 10 years. My bar cabinet is filled with Maker's Mark and the small batch family of Booker's, Basil Hayden and Knob Creek. You got to focus on your core business now, but do you miss that cachet? 
You know, I'd say there's a there's an age and stage. And so I started at what we call Old Fortune Brands uh, back in 06 on the spirit side of the business and was really part of integrating a very large acquisition we'd done at the time, which brought, you know, makers and some of those other brands into the fold. It was a great time to be in booze and it was a lot of fun, but I would say being on the housing side of the business now couldn't be more exciting. You know, you, home is is kind of where it happens. And so as you've entered, I've entered that, that stage of my life. There are four kids. We interact around our house. We live around our house. Our friends have built homes, redecorated homes. It's, it's just a very cool space to be in. And we're going to get so deep into the weeds on that, Nick, in just a second. But before we dive deep into the component parts of a new or remodeled home, let's take a look at a little bit of some of the headlines that are driving the industry. I've done some remodeling work in my own upstate after a frost dam, did a number on my kitchen. My builder, Jim Miltenberger, told me where lumber prices are, and I winced. Now, prices have come down a bit from their peak, but what's the state of play in raw materials right now? Look, I mean, we've gone through a really tough inflationary period really since COVID struck. March, you know, February, March of last year, it actually struck our business in China a little bit before that. And, you know, for a very short time, I think like most businesses, you know, things kind of slowed down or seized up. And but very early on, you know, we were looking at credit card data going, there's something different here. You know, we saw categories down 20 percent, 40 percent, some down 105%, right? Which meant those companies were sending out more money than they were taking in, literally. And we saw housing flat and then start to tick up and start to tick up and start to tick up. It was the only category across every consumer category. And so, you know, what what you experienced with the lumber was simply, you know, as, as people shut down to stave off COVID, and yet consumers really leaned into their homes at the same time, it caused a huge strain on the supply chain. We're still working through it. We'll be working through it for a while. You mentioned your business in China, Nick. We've seen these news reports that show the traffic jam of container ships outside the port of L.A. that make rush hour over O'Hare look like a drive in the park. You talked about supply chain in your investor presentation back in April. Do we have enough dock workers and truck drivers to get your product to market? It's a challenge. And I think any business leader you have on your show right now would tell you it's an unbelievable challenge. You know, containers are short, boats are short, stuff's getting rid around the world. And to your point, you know, even if you had more containers and boats, do you have enough workers to get it through the ports and there's a ton of congestion? And so it's a challenge. Now at Fortune Brands, you know, we have something we call the Fortune Brands Advantage, which is our business system across all of our business units. It's the few things we choose to really excel at. And those are complexity reduction, global supply chain management and category management. And I'd say, thank goodness, Global supply chain management is one because it's allowed us to outperform. And so while we've been challenged, you know, like everyone else, we've been able to outperform. We've been able to get more containers on more boats at better pricing, still hugely inflationary versus where it was, but because we've really dedicated ourselves to building out a capability to manage that. And so it's helped. It will continues to be a challenge. And I think first and foremost, our consumers and our customers who need product, you know, and that that is our Our job, I mean, we're serious about our purpose of fulfilling dreams of home. And so if we can't get it to you, you know, you can't finish your home. And so we press on it. It will get better, but it's uh, it's no doubt been a tough journey. So let's sort of take a step back in time, Nick. I keyed into Chicago in my intro, this marquee city of the Western Hemisphere. But your career, listening to your accent, strangely began in Europe with an undergraduate degree focused on law and economics at one of the premier foreign affairs schools in Paris. What brought you there? Well, I'm I'm a bit of a mutt. So I I was originally born in South Africa, lived there till my early teens. Then my family left. Uh, I grew up in Paris, middle school, high school, two years of university, one year in in, uh, D.C. at Georgetown, and then really moved to Chicago for for grad school, which was which was Northwestern law. And so I've lived a few places, hence the accent is almost incomprehensible. So thank you for noting it. You know, of all the places I've lived, including, you know, since then, Canada, Australia, and some time in Cleveland. Chicago is actually a place I've lived the longest, funnily enough. I did love your, your intro. I was thinking about, you know, what, what uh, my O'Leary cow is that kicked off, you know, rebirth in, in my life, and my career. But, you know, it, it is a great city. Fortunate to be here. Fortunate to have, you know, companies like Fortune Brands and the community we have around it. And, and most of all, the talent that we have access to in a place like Chicago. For guys so focused on the 
ins and outs of building, maintaining, rebuilding, remodeling a home, Nick. Strangely, your background is in law. You went from Paris to Northwestern's School of Law, got your JD focusing on banking, corporate finance, securities law. How did the work and training of becoming a lawyer shape how you look at problems today? It was hugely helpful. I mean, I, you know, I think some of my strengths are, you know, I'm hopefully, you know, hopefully a good leader, hopefully a good strategic thinker. I think what the law gave me was really, uh, firstly, an understanding of the fundamentals, you know, of working in business. It's easy enough to apply that, although it probably drives my law department crazy when I have an opinion. But more importantly, it does lend one a, a, a discipline and an analytical framework for pulling things apart. And I think that was a perfect complement to the way I was otherwise disposed, which was you know, big picture thinking, but coupled with what you know, they really put you through you know, three years of law school, and then I practiced for about another 10 years. It kind of forces a discipline and forces a way of just breaking down problems and then putting them back together and finding a path forward. And I so I think it was very complimentary. Wouldn't, wouldn't change it for anything in the world. We mentioned Deerfield in the introduction, where Fortune has its headquarters, the small town just north of Chicago, home to about 20,000 people. The motto of the town, Nick, is the community that lives and works together, which seems to have permeated into the culture of your company. How did you find Fortune Brands originally as a place to work and what attracted you to it? It's interesting you mentioned Deerfield. I mean, it is a fascinating community and it is kind of live and work. It's a residential community. And yet, you know, across the street, there uh, is Caterpillar down the streets, Discovery, got Baxter, got Walgreens. So just a, a slew of, of Fortune 500, S&P 500s kind of up and down the, the street here. And part of it is the proximity to great schools, a great city, and, and a great infrastructure. And that is a lot of the basis. You know, I was working downtown Chicago, you know, got this role kind of mid-2000s, you know, up at Fortune Brands and, and start to discover the company. And I'll tell you what I found exceptional and, you know, continues to be true today is obviously it's a pretty amazing place. I'm biased, but it's also a very humble place. It's very sort of very grounded in its, its Midwestern roots. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time crying about what we do. We really kind of think forward about what the next problem is that's coming at us or how we could have done better about something um, and just get on with it. And so, you know, you mentioned, you know, 27 and a half thousand employees. We only have 130 at corporate which means, you know, we run very lean. So we roll up our sleeves, we do the work. And that's been true since the day I joined. And so, you know, you ask the question, well, what did I learn? And I came through the door on day one, I had impact in this business, you know, and that was over 15 years ago. And, and so because of the way we're structured, you get the combination of being able to have impact, but really having resources of a pretty large company. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's fairly unique. And so we've continued that culture and it's kind of very deep in our ethos. And so, you know, we look for people that think big and really prioritize and work on, on the things that matter most, but aren't afraid to, to kind of get in there and, and, and do it themselves with their teams and, and kind of, you know, we all lead in it together. I mean, talking about rolling up your sleeves and doing the work, Nick, back in September, 2019, Fortune Brands announced that you were going to succeed Christopher Klein as CEO after this multi-year succession plan. I want to focus a little bit on that trajectory. You came into the company as president of the newly formed Global Plumbing Group. What were your initial goals there and how did you go about building one of the strongest segments of the firm? Let's geek out for a minute on the glories of Amon Fawcett. You know, it's hard not to, so don't tempt me because I will get really excited about uh, about Amo and Fawcett. It's, it's, a, it's actually a pretty special thing. Look, beyond law, I mean, my, my time really was around consumer brands, right? I, you know, I'd spent a decade at, at Beam. We built that company to now be the, the number three global spirits firm and as Beam Suntory. And it really, you know, spirits is about the brand and it's about the consumer and it's about the occasion. And so that was really the mindset that I brought in as I, as I uh, came into this business and, you know, went into the Moen business, very venerable business, market leader, been around for, I think it was 75 years at the time, over 80 years now, based in innovation. But I kind of took a step back from that category and... You know, I looked at it and in, in my feeling, it, it could really go one of a couple of ways. It could either become a truly branded, relevant category driven by innovation and phenomenal marketing, or it could risk being commoditized. And, you know, that, that's not an option for us. I mean, we, we are first and foremost, a branded consumer company, right? We happen to be in building products. 
but it's really about the consumer. It's about having brains. And so, you know, looking at that, the opportunity was clear to me. It was really to take that business, which had an unbelievable legacy brand position and an unbelievable route to market and completely rejuvenate it. So we actually formed a kind of an Uber company around it, uh, which we refer to as Global Plumbing Group, did a series of acquisitions in the luxury space and so bought five beautiful luxury brands and stitched together what we call the house of roll, which is kind of the, you know, the highest and most curated thing you can do with a bathroom or, uh, or, or, or some of your kitchen and brought those together and really moved from a business that was, you know, a branded house to a house of brands, infused it with marketing, hired innovation people, invested in the brand, invested in the team and the talent and took it on this journey. And so if you start to look around, you know, the way Moen was five years ago, I'd say very storied, but not that distinctive to where it is today and what that team has done and continued to do in the time since I've been running the business. It's pretty phenomenal. You know, it, it's really hits on every note. We do a lot of consumer research. I mean, it's love for innovation. It's love for style. It's love for design. It's modern and it's exciting. And then our luxury brands, you know, the house roll brands really stand for something too. And so it's pretty phenomenal stuff. And it's a, to me, it's a bit of a case study between, you know, you could sort of just rest on the laurels and let the category be commoditized, or you could really kind of double down and invest, try to do something different. And now we're really on the cusp of taking everything I just talked about and moving it into the next year, which will be to digitize water. And that's going to be a whole new chapter in the story. So, you know, very exciting history, but even more excited about what's ahead. I did look at the investor presentation and I saw that picture of the app and the iPhone in someone's hands. And it was all about, you know, water management. Tell us a little bit about that. The idea is really whole home water management, right? And so if you think about water for, for, for a long time, the way it's come in your house and the way it's been used has been the same right? Product designs have changed, finishes changes, but really the function of plumbing in the house has not changed. And that is about to be radically different. A number of years ago, we launched the digital shower. We were the first to really digitize the valve. I mean, the people had digital controllers, but we digitized the control of the water, the valve that went in the wall. And that really set the platform and groundwork for what we've done since. And we've now evolved that into you know, faucets you can speak to, but really uh, what you're referring to in the Vester presentation is our Flow by Moan product, which is a product that sits on your water main. It uses algorithmic learning mm. to learn about the way water flows through your house and will either tell you if you have a drip leak, which is going to conserve an enormous amount of water for homes in the future, or in the event of a catastrophic leak, will actually shut your water main off. And the thing about catastrophic water leaks, there are more dollars spent on insurance claims for water damage than they are for fire and burglary combined. Now, do you have a fire alarm? Yes. Do you have a burglary alarm? Yes. Do you have a water alarm? No. No. So it's not too far ahead, right, to get to where this is going when people are going to really be able to avoid massive damage as well as, you know, there's a big environmental play there by controlling the water experience in their house. So Nick, I go to Lowe's and Home Depot a lot. And like everyone else, you walk into one of them, you go down to the through the aisles. You don't think about fortune brands when you're in those big box stores. Tell us about some of the other names that listeners are going to instantly recognize when they think about a sink, a deck, a door, or a padlock. Sure. So, you know, fortune brands is not a consumer brand. Fortune brands is an investor brand. It's an employee brand. It's an ESG brand increasingly, but we, we have no intention of building it as a consumer brand. We build the brands that sit within our house. And so, you know, you mentioned Moen, number one brand in plumbing. We have Master Lock, you know, the, every middle school kid in America touches a, a Master Lock padlock. It, it has a huge share of the portable security. Century Safe, you know, the leader in safes. Recently bought a company in 2018 called Fiberon. You know, Fiberon is a big player in the composite decking space. So, you know, you've heard of Trex. Azac is also in that space. We're going to build the Fiberon brand to be, you know, a clear leader in, in the composite decking space. We have a number of brands inside of our cabinets business. Those I'd say to consumers, I mean, they're brands like Omega that, you know, have consumer recognition, but mostly they're well known to the trade. There's a lot of, you know, reliability, service quality that's built into a whole suite 
of brands over there. Thermatrue Doors, the leader in exterior doors. We recently bought a company called Larson, also the leader in screen and storm doors. So very, you know, complimentary business there. And I could go on and on. I mean, there's a big, big stable of consumer brands. I would say as a rule, we tend to build on market leading positions. It's it's not to say that you know, challenger businesses aren't great. I worked in one, I had a ton of fun, but what we do is really build market leading positions. So most of the brands I mentioned are really the leaders in their space. And if they're not, they will be. And so that's really how we think about it. And it really starts with understanding the consumer working back from there. Talking about using your phrase, well-known to the trade, you know, often the contractor shows up in their truck, bringing the materials they're installing to the job site. And the homeowner might not think a lot about what is in that box. What differentiates when you and your management team think about either the quality, fit, finish, production approach, what differentiates the Fortune brand's products from other companies whose products are going to end up in our home for decades? So, you know, we think equally, and when we talk about innovation, we think equally of the consumer and the contractor. And we innovate about 50-50 for both. And so our aim is to obviously create more and more value for consumers, but it's to make the, the contractor's life easier. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about that pro. They are the gatekeeper to the business. I mean, no consumer is going to argue if their pro says, do not put this in your house. You know, they're not going to argue. And so, you know, we have very, very strong ties, whether it be with, you know, plumbers or kitchen installers or people on the door side of the business. And we constantly are seeking to make their lives easier. Usually, you know, if you look at demographics, population, number of people available, you know, if we can save time for them, that's a huge value. And so by investing time there, I think we've been able to maintain our position. It's also service and quality, right? They know they can rely on us. They know they can, we're always at the end of, you know, a phone line. We have customer service centers. They're well-stuffed. We'll get you what you need if it's missing. And I, you know, that's decades and decades of building that kind of position and that sort of reputation. So switching gears, I mean, there's been no shortage of stories about the red hot housing market over the past 18 months. Wall Street Journal recently reported that the pace of home sales is exceeding where it was even before the pandemic. That's a lot of facelifting needed when the for sale sign comes down on these properties. What trends have you seen in the housing market and how has it impacted your approach and your work with both those contractors you're talking about and also you know, the end homeowners? Well, I'll just start with what's going on. We can talk a little bit about the trends. If you, if you think about what's going on, I mean, it's almost like a perfect storm in the making. You have a massive demographic called millennials, right? Which delayed home purchasing for almost 10 years versus vis-a-vis -vis Gen X, right? And so you had this big population group come through, but eventually, you know, as people get married, have kids, the, you know, the, the loft with your three roommates doesn't work out so well anymore. And so you had that sort of tsunami of demographic come. You've got a big population called boomers that are living longer in their homes and seeking to redo their homes to make them fit for the next stage of life. And you've got this massive home underbuild, which really coming out of the, the great financial crisis, just you know never got to the pace it needed to be at to make up for the demographics. And so all of that <laughs> came together at the same time where I think people really realized, boy, there are not a lot of homes out there. There are not a lot of new homes coming into the market. And the housing stock is older than it's ever been it needs to be renovated. And so as that all came together and, you know, COVID only shone a huge light on it because by the way, you had to go shelter at home and work from home and entertain at home and educate at home. It really kind of caused this huge surge, which is going to take years. It's going to take years to, to, to sort of address it. Some of the trends that we've seen, consumers, you know, really want to be able to use their homes, you know, for multiple different things. As I said, they want to be able to certainly sleep there, eat there, but work there, entertain there, a huge trends around outdoor living. And so a lot of entertaining outside. And that's why we've continued to build our outdoor living business around decking, access, doors, railing, a lot of trends around, you know, understanding kind of the purpose and products, the purpose of the companies that make them, the commitments that those companies are making to sustainability. And you know, we're seeing more and more interest around that. For example, we just launched something called Mission Moen in 2020, that's to save a trillion gallons through through our efforts in product innovation by 2030. By the way, a trillion gallons, like, you know, what is that? It's equivalent to what New York City uses in three years, right? We will offset that. That really resonates. It's, personally, it's the right thing to do, 
but it really resonates with consumers. You know, our decking, 94% recycled content. It's, it's recycled plastic and sawdust instead of, you know, gorgeous trees that you're chopping down to, to make this stuff that really resonates. And so, you know, those are things I could go on. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, sustainable procurement and wood, it, it matters to consumers and we're finding them really gravitate to that. So the more we can speak to it, I think we've got a long history in it, but the more we can speak to it, it's really hitting the right note. I mean, talking about New York City, where I live, and those three years worth of water that come through our, our pipes all the way from the Catskills down through the aqueduct system, the New York Times reported that more apartments were sold in Manhattan during the past quarter of this year than at any time in the past 32 years. And that stands in stark contrast to this time last year when sellers and agents stopped counting days on the market because of such dim prospects. With a caveat that you know nobody knows the future, what do you expect the housing market to look like over the next couple of years? And how is Fortune Brands preparing for it? I fundamentally believe that the housing market is going to be very strong for the next five to 10 years. And I, that's not just Nick's opinion, right? I mean, we, we have a department of people that are a lot better than I am at looking at the data and really pulling it apart and understanding it. And so that, you know, that is a fundamental that's really based in demographics. And so therefore you position your portfolio to benefit from that base. And then think about what trends, you know, we talked about some trends, what trends, what secular trends sit on top of that, that are going to give that extra tailwind to the portfolio. And so that's how you position the company long-term strategically. Now, with that as a backdrop, you know, what I'll tell you is housing is not discretionary. Sometimes the timing around housing is discretionary. And so if there's an interest rate shock, or if there's a pandemic, you know, as you refer, consumers may pull back. In COVID, it was a matter of weeks, but whether it's weeks or a couple quarters, or even, you know, we've seen it sometimes be three quarters, it's our job as a management team to manage this business, to smooth out any of that. And so we can deliver consistently for our, for our shareholders. And so that's how we think about it. It's position for the growth and then manage the business very well. So you're delivering it consistently, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, it's sometimes you, you might see a pullback in the market, then people come right back in. And actually, you know, you, you never, you never hope for a, a, a pandemic, but allowed this business to demonstrate what it could do. And we actually grew margin in, in Q2 of last year, you know, remarkably, as we just saw this coming and we said, look, you know, we're, we're going to make the right decisions. We're going to prioritize. And not only did we grow margin, we ended up investing more incremental dollars in 2020 than we had any time in the last five or 10 years. And so, you know, it's a pretty simple formula. If you really believe in the growth and you position for it and you're there to meet the consumer where they are, but then you manage your business highly, you can, you can really do well in this environment. Delivering consistently. That's what we do inside the Ice House. And we're doing it with Nick Fink right now. After the break, we're going to dive into some of the new products that Fortune Brands Home and Security are bringing to market, the 10-year listing anniversary of the company, and what's happening in the future. That is all coming up right after this. The transition to electronic trading is gaining support in fixed income markets, presenting opportunity and driving demand for data. At ICE, we're a leading provider for fixed income data and analytics. We offer a comprehensive fixed income execution solution via ICE Bonds, committed to execution quality, transparency, and information. We provide a wide range of platforms with deep liquidity pools that support multiple trading protocols. Our fixed income indices can be tailored to your investment strategy, powered by our data. Our ESG data offers increased transparency into fixed income markets. Access the ICE fixed income ecosystem, including the ICE Bonds execution platforms, evaluated pricing and analytics via ICE fixed income select. By creating a single point of access for our execution platforms, customers can utilize a variety of trading protocols and manage risk. ICE supports your end-to-end -end fixed income workflow, increasing transparency, execution efficiency, and data access across the fixed income marketplace. Welcome back. Before the break, Nick Fink, the CEO of Fortune Brands Home Security, and I were talking about his career, the company's mission and purpose and trends in the housing market. We talked a little bit about millennials before the break, Nick. ICE Mortgage Technology tracks millennials entering the housing market through our 
Millennial Tracker, which tracks closed loan applications for younger U.S. home buyers. The most recent report shows that millennials across the U.S. are taking advantage of the environment, as you talked about before the break, buying homes with an average loan of about $230,000. Take us into the mind of the millennial homeowner. You know, I know the way I think about it when I talk to my contractor and think about the products, fit, finish, the things that I want to get for the home. How are they approaching, you know, some of the products and areas that that you have? And are they as discriminating as I am or how are they different than me? You know, I think there there is an open mindedness there. You know, a lot of the brands that we grew up with are sort of like these are the brands. These are the brands you'll buy, and they're going to be. The, I think there 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 is an openness to understanding what's out there. Now they, you know, they, the the wonderful thing actually about the generational interactions is that you know millennials, Gen X, boomers they actually like each other, and so they, you know, the the parents will say to the kids like what's trendy, and the kids will say to the parents what's reliable, and this is based on real consumer research we do. You know, as opposed to if you think you know. 60s, 70s, I mean, the generations wanted nothing to do with each other. And so it's a very different dynamic. And so it allows for brand continuity, but there is an open-mindedness to, to learn about the brands and to understand, as I said earlier, you know, what are their purpose? Are they making a positive impact on communities, on society? And are they innovative? There's a, a really, really strong interest in whether brands are innovative or not. And so, you know, increasingly we've positioned our brands around the innovation that we bring to the market, not just because innovation, you know, new products, new sales, but really because it resonates a halo on the whole brand family that's been really effective. And so, you know, I think those are some of the things that are, are, are very top of mind for a millennial buyer. I mean, talking about innovation, Nick, and we were mentioning water a little bit in the first half of the show, water scarcity is a huge issue, particularly in the West and Southwest, a product that's captured the attention of social media seems to be Nebia by Moen. You joined forces with this company, Nebia. It was a San Francisco-based startup and created a shower that provides more pressure using about half of the water. Can you tell us a little bit about how this partnership between a company launched on Kickstarter and this your 60-year-old Cleveland-based faucet and fixture manufacturer, how did this marriage come about? Yeah, well, it really speaks to the mindset of both businesses, by the way. The Nebia folks are wonderful, kind of near and dear to my heart. Really an amazing team out there. But you take a business like Mo, and I think it's it's easy for people to become a little bit complacent. And that's not the case at all. I mean, you know, our team will look outside and say, who's doing what we haven't figured out how to do? And, you know, saw what Nebia was doing and reached out and started a conversation with them. You know, and on one hand, we got brand and route to market really powerful. And they'd really nailed this atomization of water technology, which is very hard to do. I mean, it's 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 not just to have a shower that has lower flow to create that pressure. I mean, think of what a almost like a power washer could do on a much more gentle scale, right? It's not a ton of water coming through, but, but it's very powerful. And so started a conversation at one point, you know, I, I went out, arrived at their offices, you know, just as you'd imagine, textbook startup offices in San Francisco are very cool. And the first thing they did was they threw me a towel and told me to get in the shower. And they sat immediately outside the shower in, in a conference room and waited for me to get out. And I said, and they said, what do you think? And I said, Let, let's do something together. And that was, that was kind of the birth of it. And what's most amazing is, you know, they, they knew the technology. We know water. And so by putting our forces together, we were really able to engineer some phenomenal products and have continued. I think we're on Nebia 4.0 now. Describe what's actually happening in one of these faucets. So it's called atomization. So it's the way that you take a water droplet, if you think, and you you, you break it up into you know, a gazillion smaller droplets. And so it's it's much smaller droplets that are hitting you with some force. So you know it's you're using a lot less water. The hard part is the the hydrofluid dynamics. And so as that smaller droplet travels through the air, it loses heat. And so why people weren't able to do this is by the time it hit your skin, we're talking about milliseconds, right? It wasn't warm anymore. And these guys nailed figuring out, you know, how to break it up, but retain the heat and bring it to the consumer. At that meeting, I thought it would be this sort of, you know, misty kind of sensation because, you know, you see videos online and it really isn't. It's got, it's got some, some real force to it. And so that was kind of the breakthrough technology. And I, you know, I'll tell you a quick story about this team just because they're, they're remarkable. Tim Cook is an investor in the business along with Eric Schmidt. And, you know, you sort of go, oh, well, you know, how did that happen? Do you guys you know, just get together in San Francisco at your, your startup things? And uh, no, the founders actually like tracked him down, you know, into the shower, tracked on Tim Cook into the shower at, at the Equinox Gym in Palo Alto <laughs> until he finally like conceded to trying this thing. 
and tried out like a, a beta version and, you know, remarkably like leaned in with them, helped them with their business plan and then invested in the business. And it, so it just speaks to the kind of people they are. You mentioned the decking made of sawdust and recycled material across your portfolio. Just give us a flavor of some of the other innovations that you're really excited about. Yeah, I mean, you look, certainly digital is going to play a, a huge role in connecting the portfolio. And so, you know, we talked a bit about the digitization of water. I think that's that's going to have a huge impact on people's homes and lives. We're digitizing the security space, right? And so, you know, through Master Lock, through our safes, the ability to really, you know, control, to have an audit trail to know who's touched it. You know, take Master Lock, I mean, certainly every middle school locker, but we also have a large commercial business where we help companies manage safety inside of their facilities. You want to control who has access to what to keep people safe. And, you know, we, we see a big future in digitizing that. We've been, been investing behind that. And, you know, I think that is clearly coming. And then, you know, just some of the, the product engineering that we put into how to make things, how to make them perform at higher levels and how to do it in an ever more sustainable way. And so, you know, I'll give you a simple example, but you know, I mentioned Thermatree Doors. Right. It's the market leader in exterior doors, but it's not the market leader just because, you know, we got a big position. It's because it's actually an innovative product. It's they're fiberglass doors. They look like wood. We put them in front of consumers. They kind of tell the difference. The performance is night and day. We actually have an innovation center near Toledo, Ohio, and you go in and they'll, they'll have a, literally a, a plexiglass room with a thermometry door and they fill it to the top with water wow. and, and not a drop comes out. And, you know, it's, it doesn't warp. And so that, you know, that's really innovation driven. We continue to invest it to, to make it better and better all the time. That allows energy efficiency, you know, longer lifespan. And I tell you what, builders love it. And it costs them more, right, than a regular door. They love it because they never have to go back on site and repair this door because it doesn't get dinged and it performs at a much higher level. And so, you know, that's another example. The decking, I, you know, I think we're just at the early innings of, of what that will do over time in terms of product performance and greater sustainability. And so you sort of look across the, you know, the, the patch, I mean, even, you know, even our cabinets business, the way we've been able to innovate, you know, organization you know, systems inside of cabinets to make, you know, a kitchen more functional for people. And then take that all the way through to digitization. You know, we pioneered the, the first visualization of a kitchen that you could build online and then push it to cart. You know, we did that with one of our major retailer partners. So you could, you know, instead of going and having a very challenging experience, you know, with measuring tapes, trying to figure out, you know, how to do this, you could actually just create your floor plan online, go online, sit there with a glass of wine or a beer or whatever, put the whole thing together, push it to cart, see what it will cost, order the things. And I think, you know, that's probably a little bit of clue about where we can see that business going over time as well. And so, you know, it's really across the patch. And the nice thing about it is wherever we, invest and do well, we're, we're well rewarded for it. Nick, companies are paying a lot closer attention, as you've mentioned earlier, to environmental social governance factors, using these considerations to attract some of your 27,000 people, meet regulatory disclosure requirements, meet the needs of investors. I mean, one of the first slides on your investor deck focuses on your commitment to ESG. Can you walk us through how you and the management team think about ESG and driving long-term shareholder value? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I just start by saying it's, it's, it's very deeply embedded in our DNA and it's kind of been there for a long time. I think what we learned more recently was it wasn't just good enough to do it. You actually had to explain to people what you were doing and why you were doing it. And so we've been doing, you know, human rights audits on all of our suppliers going back, I don't know, 15, 20 years, right? It was just what you do is the right thing to do. If we were going to buy from you, we had to be sure that we were treating people correctly. But as, you know, I alluded to being, you know, somewhat of a humble Midwestern company, we didn't shout this stuff a lot. And as, as the investor lens and the employee lens and the consumer lens has changed, we've started to collate our, our activities and, and talk about it more. And so I'd say it's part of our DNA. We've done a lot, but by no means are we or anybody else done. And so what we're now working on is what is the next frontier and how do we push further into this? What are already our competitive advantages that we can build on? And what are potential opportunity areas where we should be doing more? And it's, you know, it, it's from our board down. Early last year, we renamed our NOM and Gov committee, the NESG committee. And so we specifically asked the board to have board oversight over our activities. It's embedded into my personal objectives 
for each year and into my team's personal objectives. And so whether it be, you know, the diversity angle where it's been wonderful, it's been wonderful to see the progress that's being made so much more work to do, but progress being made, whether it's some of the environmental initiatives I've touched on or whether, you know, it's our safety record. We take it, it really seriously and we really work on it. You know, the last thing I'll say is, you know, we, we do a lot of acquisitions. We're a very acquisitive company. You know, we talk a lot about synergies and building business cases, but one of the synergies we bring to every acquisition we do is that ESG lens. You know, there isn't a company that we buy where we haven't improved the safety record. So that means people actually go home safer because we're the owner of that business and we take huge pride in that. Earlier this week, Fortune Brands and Home Security celebrated the 10th anniversary of becoming a publicly listed company. In those 10 years as an independent company, what sense do you get sort of week in, week out of being public, making the disclosures you need to make, putting it all out there for your investors? How does it make you a better or stronger company being open to public ownership? I'm a huge believer in it. I really am. I've worked both sides of that equation. You mentioned when I joined 2015 back on this side of the business, which at that point it was a freestanding public company. I mean, that was a choice. That was a choice to come back into the U.S. publicly held world. And I really believe that that transparency and accountability drives higher performance. Now, we're incredibly fortunate. Our combination of our track record and the incredible investor base that we have allows us to make long-term decisions, right? And so we will favor the right decisions for all of our stakeholders over the long run and try to deliver you know, consistent performance quarter in, quarter out, but we're making long-term decisions. And I think if you get that combination of being able to be long-term focused, but doing it with the transparency and accountability and scrutiny of a public company, I think it's a very, very powerful combination. As part of commemorating that 10-year anniversary of your public listing, Nick, you announced two key affordable housing initiatives. Can you tell us first about the Dreams of Home Community Re Revitalization Project? Yeah, you know, I mean, what better way to celebrate 10 years of success, both for you know our team and our shareholders, than to give back? And I was immensely proud of my team when when that, you know, when I said, how do you want to celebrate this? And that's how, that's how they wanted to celebrate it. And so really two, two big initiatives there, uh, the first being Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we've long time been partners of Habitat for Humanity. Some of my colleagues on our exec team are board members of some of the, the Habitat arms. And so, you know, you know what that is, building homes, doing it in our neighborhoods, rebuilding together. The other partner is a really fascinating organization and because they're really about rehabbing homes. And as I mentioned to you, housing stock is really aged and nothing will bring a neighborhood down faster than when somebody abandons a home. Mm -hmm. The statistics are unbelievable. I mean, it is, it's not months, it's weeks after a home is abandoned in the neighborhood, that whole neighborhood can start to go on a decline within weeks because you can have squatters move in, you know, bad things happen people start to leave the, the street or the neighborhood. And so by going in and helping revitalize and invest in these homes, we can get back to the people in those homes. We can really get back to that whole community. And so we're, we're going to start by focusing on communities where, you know, we operate, we have plants you know, all around the, frankly, all around the world, but, you know, a lot of facilities in, in the U.S. And we're going to reinvest in those communities to help them stay safe and strong. Fortune also has been a longtime supporter of the Nature Conservancy, one of the world's most effective global conservation groups. So much of your work together has been focused on the Great Lakes Urban Water Working Group Initiative, which seeks to conserve, restore, protect fresh water around the Great Lakes region. Why did you adopt this cause and why is water conservation outside of the home ecosystem so critical to the work that you're involved in? Well, we live, breathe, and, and bleed water, for lack of a better term. It's near and dear to what we do. And so we think about water conservation in every facet. I mean, it's certainly inside of the residence and, and what does that mean? But, you know, we'll take Moen engineers and take them out to all of our facilities and look at how we're using water and help them get them to help us improve. And they've done that very, very effectively. And so it just seemed like a very natural partnership. A lot of our businesses are, are based around the Great Lakes. I mean, obviously we're you know, here just five miles away in Deerfield, Mullins based in Cleveland, Mosflex based in Milwaukee, our outdoors business is based in Toledo. And so we've got a number of businesses really kind of clustered around the Great Lakes and you know, we're so grateful for them. So they're, they're kind of near and, dear to our, near and dear to our heart. And it's one of the world's greatest resources. My brother-in-law is actually one of the EPA leaders in charge of the Great Lakes. And so I spent a lot of time talking to him about it. You know, it's not just a great 
resource for us here in the Midwest. I mean, it's one of the world's great, it's the world's greatest water, fresh water store, and it needs to be conserved and protected. As we wrap up, Nick, I think in January 2020, you joined the board of directors of another great New York Stock Exchange listed company, Constellation Brands, ticker symbol STZ, one of the foremost producers of beer, wine, and spirits. It brings us really back to that first question I asked you about Jim Beam. Constellation has more than 100 brands in its portfolio, including Corona, Mondavi, and High West Whiskey. Now, almost two years into your service, how's it been stepping back into that world of liquor, wine, and beer? It's a lot of fun. I mean, obviously spent you know a lot of time in that space and 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 it's a wonderful space and the brains really matter to people and and help people connect. They're a wonderful team. And a lot of the themes that I've you know I've talked about on this really leadership in community giving and driving diversity, some of the initiatives around investing in minority and female-owned businesses are just remarkable. Their commitment to their consumers, I think, is second to none. I mean, it's just been frankly I've been blown away by you know the way they talk about consumers and the level of commitment they have to to authenticity it's been a lot of fun to be in that space but i'd say it's also been you know hugely beneficial just to see the overlap frankly between our businesses and some of you know what i've been able to learn and hopefully been able to share fortune brands and all residential focused companies have been through a whirlwind two years what do you think's next for fortune brands well, I think we're really on the cusp of, you know, the next big area on housing expansion, but it's going to be different, right? This is not same old, same old. I think it's going to be driven by some really exciting secular winds on top of the demographics I talked about. And so we're going to lean into that. It is going to mean we're going to have to continue to disrupt ourselves. We're going to have to transform ourselves. We're going to invest heavily in digital to do it. It's going to be a very exciting time to be at this business. Well, a very exciting time to be in the business and great talking to you, Nick. Thanks so much for joining us inside the ISS. Thanks, Josh. It was a pleasure being here. And that's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Nicholas Fink, CEO of Fortune Brands Home and Security Incorporated. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at icehouse podcast our show is produced by stefan capriel with production assistance from pete ash and ian wolf i'm josh king your host signing off from the library of the new york stock exchange thanks for listening we'll talk to you next week information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 